Yates. I'm a wheelchair user with cerebral palsy and I'm an accessibility consultant and journalist living in Glasgow, Scotland. Although you might be able to tell from my accent that I'm not originally from Scotland, but more on that later. WizKids have kindly asked me to talk to you guys about my experiences and my adventures as a disabled person and a little bit about my career as well. And before I start telling you my stories, I just wanted to say thank you so much for, to WizKids for asking me to do this. Um, they're an amazing organisation that provides so many resources and so much information to young wheelchair users. And I've been lucky enough to be involved in some of their Scottish events and activities. So thank you so much for asking me to do this. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my life, my experiences, and the things that I've been able to enjoy and be involved in within my life. My journey, I guess, started properly when I was 16. I had what I would class as quite a usual childhood, apart from being a wheelchair user and having cerebral palsy. Um, I went to mainstream primary school, mainstream secondary school, and yeah, there's not really that much to report until I was 16. And I was nominated by a staff member at my secondary school to go on a literal journey of a lifetime with a charity called JOLT, which funnily enough stands for the Journey of a Lifetime Trust. And JOLT every two years takes disabled or disadvantaged young people to far-flung exotic locations to have holidays and experiences that they'd never really thought would be possible. And I was fortunate enough to be nominated to go with JOLT in the summer of 2008 when I was 16 to Namibia, Lesotho and South Africa. And this trip really truly did change my life. Not only did we do things like teach English in Lesotho um, and cage dive with sharks, which was quite an experience in itself because I lost the feeling of my legs in the water when cage diving. And one of my legs was hanging out of the cage. So I'm very, very lucky to have both of these and that a shark didn't bite one off that day. But there we go. Um, but Jolt didn't only change my life in the sense that I had these amazing experiences. It changed my life because I realised there and then, at the age of 16, my capabilities as a disabled person, not just my limitations. And I think that's so vital because quite often as disabled people, we're taught to think about our limitations rather than our capabilities. And I realised very, very quickly that, yes, as a wheelchair user, I wasn't able to go over sand dunes or even push myself in that rich, deep sand by myself. I needed somebody's physical help in order to do that. But at the same time, there were a lot of people on the trip who maybe weren't physically disabled, but had had really difficult emotional experiences growing up. And there were a lot of long van journeys during the trip and that was my opportunity to use my abilities to communicate and to listen and to support them and to really thank them that way for helping me physically earlier on and um, so it was a really wonderful trip that made me realize those capabilities and i'd really encourage you watching or listening to this to think about what your capabilities are as a disabled person Yes, you might not be able to do some certain physical activities or you might find certain things around the home quite difficult to do independently. But I promise you, you will have capabilities and strengths that you'd not even realise you had if you just think about them and you learn to utilise them in a way that I was able to on Jolt. And it's worth saying as well that the people that I went on Jolt with initially were total strangers. We came from places all over the UK and we didn't know each other. But at the end of the trip, which was a month long, we truly became like family, not just friends, but family. 
and I still talk to some people from Jolt now when we have reunions and get togethers and they are honestly some of my best friends that I know that I'll keep for life. So if you're between the age of 14 and 21 and you are interested in having an adventure like that, please do look for Jolt, uh, search for the charity and see if you're interested in applying for a journey of a lifetime. Fast forward two years, I was 18 and I was doing my A-levels at school um, in 2010 and I'll be honest, I was getting a little bit worn down with studying, I was finding it quite difficult and I saw a poster in, in my sixth form lounge for the Yorkshire Schools Exploring Society and the Yorkshire Schools Exploring Society were taking um, young people from all over Yorkshire to the Sinai Desert where they were able to live with a Bedouin tribe in the Sinai Desert for three weeks and also learn to scuba dive in the Red Sea and I thought wow this sounds absolutely incredible I'd love to do that so I applied and I was successful in my application but I got a call from the Yorkshire Schools Exploring Society and there were two issues firstly the Yorkshire Schools Exploring Society had been running for 30 years but they'd not taken a disabled person before within those 30 years so I was going to be the guinea pig and I was more than happy to do that but the second issue was a little bit more difficult when I had applied after my application the female leader that was going to be going on the trip had withdrawn her application and of course I was going to quite an exotic place I wouldn't have any home comforts and I needed quite a lot of personal care so the other leaders of the trip said well you know it's not very ethical as men if we help you but we'd really like you to come on the trip how would you feel about your mum coming on the trip and being the female leader and of course at 18 years old initially I wasn't very happy at the prospect of this I wanted to be independent, I wanted to see things for myself, but I also didn't want to withdraw my application just because I was a disabled person. So my mum and I discussed it at length and we decided that it would be an amazing opportunity to be able to bond, to be able to have amazing experiences together. So we did, uh, my mum did go as a female leader on the trip and we did have the most amazing time but it wasn't without its difficulties. As I said earlier, I was the only disabled person to have ever gone on a trip and I was the only disabled person on this trip itself. So that posed a few challenges. Even getting on a camel in the Sinai Desert was really, really hard work and took me a lot longer than everybody else. I found myself when I was diving in the Red Sea, having to swim really quickly to be able to keep up with everybody else. So I did realise my limitations as a disabled person quite quickly on that trip and I did find that difficult but I had to remember in the back of my mind all those brilliant experiences I've had on Jolt and all of these capabilities that I do have and I had to learn to put those into action there on that trip as well. So an amazing experience, one that was quite difficult but I can proudly say that I managed to get my scuba diving qualification and I'm also the first wheelchair user to have crossed the Sinai Desert by camel. So that's quite a nice thing to be able to put on my CV. Fast forward another couple of years, I was um, nearly 20. Uh, it was the year of 2011 and I was at university in London. I went to Queen Mary University in London which is in the East End near Brick Lane and I'd really recommend if you're looking for a university in London but you're wanting everything all together Queen Mary as far as I'm aware is the only campus university in London so that had its real accessibility benefits for me and I'd really recommend you take a look at it. I was loving Queen Mary, loving studying there, loving being a student and an opportunity came up to go and study for my second year of my degree in Melbourne, Australia. So of course I applied 
and I was very fortunate again to get accepted. And this came with its own challenges. Moving to Australia was of course the farthest I'd ever moved, nearly the farthest that you can move um, away from home. And I was really aware that I wasn't going to know anybody. I wasn't going to have any friends, any connections. I'd have to start from scratch. But that was a challenge that I was ready to accept. So I left home, moved to Australia, and I lived in a college which had about 250 students in it. So we all ate together, our rooms were all within this college, and there were activities put on at the weekends and in the evenings. So it was really easy to get into that student bubble and to make friends. And there was one person that I was absolutely desperate to make friends with. Within this college of 250 other people, there was only one other disabled person. She was called Alex and she was a wheelchair user with cerebral palsy like me. So immediately I thought, wow, we're going to have loads in common. There's loads we're going to be able to talk about. And she's going to be able to show me all the best things to see and do in Melbourne. But however hard I tried to make friends with her, Alex just did not want to know me or to be my friend. And I couldn't really work out why or what I'd done wrong. And one weekend her parents came to visit her and they said to me, Emily, I'm really sorry, we've, we've realised that Alex isn't very keen on making friends with you. And we just want to let you know that it's not your fault, it's nothing to do with you. But Alex hasn't really met or made friends with disabled people before. And she feels that if she becomes friends with you, it'll almost make her more disabled herself. And I understood this, but I wanted to change that perception. And I wanted to show her that as two disabled people, we could have an amazing time together. So I persisted and eventually we ended up talking about travel and I found out that she'd not actually travelled independently anywhere before really. And she was desperate to do that, but didn't really have the confidence to do that. So I suggested that we go to Sydney for a few days together. I was desperate to see Sydney, never gone before. And we agreed that we would travel, just the two of us, two wheelchair users, no one to carry our bags, and we'd go and see what we could manage. And we had the best time. We saw everything that we could possibly want to see in Sydney. And we just had so many great experiences together and to do it as two wheelchair users without any extra help was something that we were both really proud of. And the cherry on top of this story, if you like, is that a year later, I'd moved back to the UK, um, I'd finished my studies in Australia, and I was at home in Yorkshire for Christmas that year. This was 2012. And Alex knocked on my door. She travelled all the way from Australia to the UK on her own, independently, to come and spend Christmas with me and my family. And to know that I'd had that kind of impact on somebody and I'd helped to build their confidence in their own abilities and capabilities was an amazing thing and something that I'm still really proud of. Um, so just to say that if you have any friends who are maybe questioning their own capabilities or you might be able to help them in certain ways or ask for their assistance in something you're not perhaps very confident about. Please do that because if we can connect and collaborate as disabled people, we're going to make society a more inclusive and better place to live and how great to be able to do that together as disabled people. So I'd come back from Australia and about 18 months before before that, so about six months before I travelled to Australia, I had applied to be a games maker, a volunteer at the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And I didn't really hear anything from them, so I thought, oh no, I've, I've not got that. Oh well, you know, that's a shame, but there's not much I can do about it. And I came back from Australia in the summer of 2012 and I got a call saying, that they'd really, really like me to volunteer at the London 2012 Paralympics as part of a, the wheelchair fencing volunteering team, preparing athletes to go out onto the field of play and making sure that they had everything that they needed. 
And I said, yes, that would be amazing. I would love to do that, please. Thank you so much for calling me back. And they also asked if I'd be willing to do a press conference to talk about my experiences as a disabled person living in London, but also volunteering and the effects that the Paralympic Games might have on disabled people in general. So I said, yes, I was more than willing to do that. And a couple of days later, I was sat at the press conference answering questions from international journalists. And Seb Coe, Sebastian Coe, who had organised pretty much the whole thing, was sat next to me at this press conference. And I remember saying that I felt that the Paralympics in London had the opportunity to lift the cloud of limitation for disabled people. And a few weeks later, in his closing ceremony speech for the Paralympic Games, he quoted me and he said what I'd said. Um, and that really did change a lot for me career-wise. I was able to get different contacts and meet different people that I'd maybe not had access to before. And I was invited by the British consulate in Rio de Janeiro to fly over to Rio because, of course, that was where the next... Olympic and Paralympic Games were going to be in 2016 and I was invited to go there to talk to the organising committee for the Olympic and Paralympic Games there but also to talk with charities and organisations about how they could further access and inclusion in Rio before the Games. And one of the things that I did was I gave a speech not dissimilar to this um, about my experiences and my life to the organising committee of the Games. And as I was giving the speech, there was a man kind of directly in front of me who was laughing at my jokes and who seemed really engaged with my talk. So I think subconsciously I directed a lot of my speech at him. And about halfway through my talk, he started looking at his phone and texting and I thought, oh no, my speech isn't very good, I'm not doing very well, he's obviously not very interested. And at the end of the talk, he stood up and he said, I'm sorry I've not given you my full attention throughout this, but I just wanted to let you know that I work for Metro Rio, which is basically Rio's equivalent of Transport for London. It deals with all the underground transport for the city. And I wondered if you'd like to come to an interview because we desperately need an accessibility consultant before the Rio 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games and you might just be the person for that. So of course I said, wow, I'd, I'd love to. So I think a day or two days later, I had the interview and I got the job. So I ended up spending the next two years living and working in Rio as an access consultant with Vivaldo, the lovely man that I'd originally met at my talk. And it was one of the best things that I've ever done. We worked on modernising existing accessibility equipment within all the stations. We did risk assessments. We trained staff in disability awareness. We got involved in public campaigns to kind of assure disabled locals in Rio that the transport system was going to meet their requirements. It was a really amazing experience. And in 2016, I came back to the UK um, about six months before the Games were to start. And I thought to myself, there must be more that can be done here, not just for athletes for the Games, but for disabled local people in Rio that perhaps haven't got the kind of attention that they deserve up until now. Isn't this an opportunity to really kind of hammer home the agenda of accessibility. So I tweeted Lonely Planet, the guidebook company, and this is the power of social media. They got back to me um, and I'd asked, were they thinking of writing any accessible guides for the Olympic and Paralympic Games? And they'd said, no, but it's something that we really should be doing. And after a couple of meetings and a couple of months, I was back out in Rio writing the Lonely Planet Guide to Accessible Rio de Janeiro and I was also out during the time of the Olympic and Paralympic Games volunteering for the wheelchair basketball in Rio but also I was able to launch the Lonely Planet Guide that I'd written and it was delivered free to athletes 
endorsed by the International Paralympic Committee and I was really proud to have something physical to hold in my hands that I'd created or at least helped to create. Um, so that was a really, really proud moment for me and something that I'll remember for a long time. And I guess the, the tip from that is just always try. You know, I, I didn't really expect Lonely Planet to get back to me after I tweeted them. But if I hadn't have tried, if I hadn't have gone for it, that would have never have happened. So regardless of how likely something is to happen, there is no harm in trying. And I think that's something that as disabled people can really get us further than we ever thought was possible. Just having, having that confidence to, to try and go for it regardless of what might happen. So after the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games, I did a few documentaries for the BBC and I also wrote a few travel articles for The Guardian, The Independent, Telegraph Travel, and similar national outlets and I moved to Glasgow and I'm now uh, the Inclusive Design Associate for CCD Design and Ergonomics, an amazing consultancy company based in London but I work with them from Glasgow and I'm involved in any kind of inclusive design accessibility projects so I've most recently worked with Heathrow Airport and also the train station at Gatwick and I absolutely love working with them. They're a really forward thinking, fun team that are doing some brilliant work to, to make things better. And I also work with an amazing disability awareness charity called Enhance the UK. Um, we have a team full of deaf and disabled people and we deliver disability awareness training, British Sign Language workshops and accessibility audits all over the UK and further afield and it's a team again that I'm so proud to be part of and a lot of those team members are class as really really brilliant friends not just colleagues. So I think another thing that's worked out really well for me is everything that I do now surrounds disability and selfishly that's brilliant for me because it means that I'm making my environment more accessible for me but also I'm helping other disabled people, other people with accessibility requirements. And I'd really recommend if any of you are thinking of going down that path to really look into what opportunities are available because using your own lived experience as a disabled person is a really powerful tool um, and one that's unique to you and you should always hold dear. So that's really the end of my story and where I'm at now, so I'm 29, living in Glasgow, consulting, writing, and also doing some brilliant work with Enhance the UK. Another thing WizKids have kindly asked me to do is share a few hints and tips with you if you're interested in having similar experiences or going down a similar career path that I did. And the first tip that I could give you is to say yes to opportunities that you're offered whilst obviously staying safe. And I think that's a really important one because I never ever thought that I'd um, go across the Sinai Desert with camels. I never thought that I'd cage dive with sharks. I never thought that I'd be out in Rio consulting or writing a Lonely Planet guide. But these things happen because I was open to them happening because I grasped an opportunity or a niche wherever I saw it coming. And whenever opportunities were offered to me, I said yes, whenever I could. And whenever I obviously wanted those opportunities, don't say yes to an opportunity that your gut doesn't say is right. But that's the first thing. The second thing will be to network and connect whenever you can. You know, it can be difficult sometimes to go to these events, whether they're on or offline and to network and work a room when you don't know anybody there. But try your best to do so because that can be where some of the best opportunities can come in. And the third and final point is to be resilient. I'm going to be totally honest with you, I've, I've discussed the brilliant things that have happened in my life in this video, but there's been a lot of failure, a lot of things that haven't gone right as well. 
And of course, in society, we often don't discuss those. You see social media accounts of people that are living brilliant, wonderful, fantastic lives that you want to live too, but you think, oh, I can't because I don't have this or I don't have that. Everybody experiences failure, but the really important thing is to be resilient and to realize those capabilities that we discussed earlier and to use those to really power yourself through when things aren't going right. When one door shuts, almost certainly another one is just about to open. And if you remember that, it can really stand you in brilliant stead. To me, success isn't about status or money or how many great stories I have to tell. It's about the ability to believe in myself and to know that ultimately things will go okay if only I believe that they will and put the work in and support the people that I love around me and do good in the world. That to me is my idea of success. And I wish you guys all the best in whatever you decide to do next. Have a look at the Jolt Charity. Have a look at Enhance the UK. Um, have a look at any access consultancy or journalism opportunities, if that's something that you fancy doing. And if you'd like to connect with me or have a chat at any point, go onto my website, emilyroseyates.co.uk, and you'll find all my social handles and have the opportunity to contact me there. So thank you so much again. Thank you to Wiz Kids, and I'm wishing you all the best for whatever it is that you do in the future. Bye.